Good morning, uh, good afternoon. I'm Catherine Marshall, uh, speaking from Washington, DC, uh, at an event that I'm looking forward to, have been looking forward to for some time, uh, which focuses on uh, Sri Lanka, on Sarvodia, uh, a remarkable organization, and on Dr. Vinya Aryaratni, who is an especially a uh, significant figure in the world of development and in conflict resolution and many others. Uh, this is part of a series of discussions that focus on the COVID impact uh, and on the way that it's affecting religious communities, but also the way religious communities are responding and influencing this. It is. Uh, three-way partnership, the Berkeley Center uh, at Georgetown University, uh, the World Faiths Development Dialogue, and the Joint Learning Initiative on Faith and Local Communities. Uh, we ask you to use the Q&A function uh, to pose any questions. This is going to be a conversation. I think it will be a lively one. Uh, and at least halfway through, I'll turn to any questions that come up. Uh, and we are recording this event so that it will be available on the Berkeley Center website not long after uh, we finish uh, the discussion today. So that's enough uh, for an introduction. And let me turn to Dr. Vinya. Uh, I think it's important to put our conversation into context. And I think first, if you could basically give us something of an update of what's happening in Sri Lanka. Uh, we know that Sri Lanka is very much affected uh, by the current crisis. It's very much a, affected by globalization. So what is happening economically, politically, socially uh, there? What's, what's, what are the high points? Thank you, Catherine, and thank you uh, for giving this opportunity to share our experience from Sri Lanka. So if I may start with the current situation in relation to COVID and also the larger context in which we are working now. Uh, as you know, Sri Lanka went through quite a difficult and challenging time. Uh, 10 years back, uh, we had a, a civil war and war came to an end in 2009. And 10 years have passed since then and there have been a lot of political changes and also country has been trying to grapple with the uh, issues related to reconciliation and also the economy. Uh, so we were in a kind of a transition when COVID-19 challenge hit us as a country. So as you know, Sri Lanka is an island nation with a small population of uh, 21.5 million people. And uh, in general, you know, uh, as a country, we have been uh, very much dependent on uh, a, an economy that was uh, um, export uh, oriented and also the uh, uh, biggest uh, revenue came from uh, remittances coming from migrant workers abroad and also particularly the women playing a very important uh, role in the economy where they uh, work as uh, garment factory workers bringing in a lot of uh, revenue to the country and also in the tea plantation so the economically though we have a uh, export oriented and uh, uh, agriculture-based uh, economy, uh, the, uh, the decade that we have been living through had been uh, full of uh, political uh, changes as well, and uh, which had affected the uh, stability in terms of uh, the socio-economic uh, context in which we had to operate as civil society as well. So uh, last year, we had uh, towards the end of the year, we had a change in, in government uh, with the new president being elected uh, on a, a very big mandate. And then there was also preparation for an election, general election in April when COVID-19 epidemic affected Sri Lanka. So the first case of the COVID-19 was reported on the 11th of March and uh, the first local, uh, first Sri Lankan, uh, individual uh, to be uh, infected with uh, COVID-19. And then very soon the government took uh, very stringent measures of uh, closing down the airport and then uh, having uh, strict quarantine measures and also having a lockdown for an extended period of two months. 
So with the initial steps taken and with the deep commitment of the government authorities and also the healthcare uh, workers and also the, uh, the, the security forces, we were able to contain the disease uh, limited to uh, less than 3000 cases as, as of today. Only 2,959 cases have been reported with only 12 deaths. And we have been able to contain the, the disease, uh, the transmission of the disease to uh, clusters. Few clusters have been there since the 11th of uh, March. So far, uh, the, uh, the restrictions that have been uh, imposed were released in, in uh, stages. And uh, now uh, from uh, next week, uh, the schools will also be uh, fully open. So I can say that as a country, we have been able to contain the transmission of COVID-19 quite effectively. The, one of the reasons that we have been able to contain had been, of course, the very robust public health care system that this country has uh, had uh, uh, for the last uh, six, seven decades. We have a universally free health care system and a preventive and a curative healthcare system which goes down to the grassroots level and also the the disease pattern which have also changed uh, during the last uh, two decades uh, a disease pattern which was mainly uh, on infectious diseases now we have a dominance of non-communicable diseases uh, and also uh, the the uh, the health services have uh, been uh, predominantly delivered by the public health care system, although the private sector is very much thriving in Sri Lanka. But there had been, on the whole, uh, quite an uh, effective uh, mechanism developed to detect disease transmission very early. And we have uh, grassroots health care workers who have been mandated with uh, 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 tracking any affected individual. There are notifiable uh, diseases in Sri Lanka even before COVID-19 hit. So there is a, a system in place that could be put into operation uh, to trace individual cases, the contacts, which was very effective during the time of COVID. So what happened soon after the lockdown was lifted was, of course, the, uh, the, the, it, it had a very big socio-economic impact. Even during the time of the, the, uh, uh, the lockdown, we had many vulnerable groups who were affected. And in fact, Sarvodaya, the organization that has been there uh, working on humanitarian issues for many, many decades, had to be also in the forefront of meeting some of the needs of the vulnerable groups who were affected. For example, daily wage earners and also those who were uh, in uh, institutional care, like children in institutional care, elders in institutional care, the disabled, uh, those who are on rehabilitation uh, centers. So we had uh, a very big responsibility on our hands uh, to reach these individuals. But the, the, the unique challenge that we had this time was that because it's a, it was an epidemic, uh, and it was, uh, there was a, a threat of even the individuals, the relief workers being affected. We had to take a uh, lot of precautions and also the, the mobility was rest restricted. So even within those constraints, we were able to mobilize volunteers. There were a lot of people who came forward to help. And we could also see the, uh, the deeper religious values also being coming to the fore to help those who were affected. Uh, Sarvodi is an organization inspired by... Yeah, I wanted tradition. to... Could we back up a little bit? Um, because yeah. uh, you are leading now uh, Sarvodia, uh, which is, yes. I think, one of the best-known NGOs in the world. And it has um, some very special features of being very firmly anchored in Sri Lanka. So when we talk about the term localization, uh, very often Sarvodia comes to mind. Uh, and it also has very deep, but also very interesting roots uh, in Buddhist values, as you just mentioned. But Sarvodia has evolved and changed with Sri Lanka. Uh, it's a very different organization today, I think, than it was when it was founded. So maybe you could give us a little bit of a sense of the Sarvodia, not so much the full story, which would take several hours, mm -hmm. Uh, but at least the sense of what 
what it is today and how it fits into the Sri Lanka landscape. Yes, Catherine. So, uh, as I was explaining, so the context, uh, uh, COVID-19 context, as uh, you very correctly said, so this was another part of the evolution process. I would say now, when you look back during the last five months, how uh, movement which have which have started completely uh, to to. Uh, get the people themselves to realize their own potential and working towards the satisfaction of basic needs in rural communities in Sri Lanka. Uh, to give a message uh, to the community based on the Buddhist traditions that there is a lot that we can do to come out of our uh, situation of uh, poverty and also uh, use our own natural resources. 20 years was a movement which was mobilizing local resources and trying to fulfill very basic needs in a community, whether it is uh, on child development or nutrition or health or environmental preservation or on education and so on. But then, uh, as you said, we had evolved to address some of the deepest structural issues, for example, rural economic development. So we have been able to use the same principles often the, the Buddhist uh, principles of sharing and then building on the, uh, the concept of right, right livelihood. So such concepts which were very much confined uh, to, to teachings or readings have been translated into action at village level and particularly building the organizational or institutional structures to address those needs uh, in a very practical way. So then it was a, the, another stage of evolution we are an institutional structure covering the entire country. In addition to being a, a voluntary movement, retaining the spirit of sharing, we were able to reach in a very structured way, nearly 15,000 villages across the country. And also it has been able to form very strong community-based organizations, which could take the lead in the social transformation that we envisage where the community's needs are identified identified by the village community itself, uh, getting also the support from outside, whether it is financial or technical uh, or other forms of assistance without really uh, developing a dependency on external help. So self-help and empowerment has been the key feature of the Sarvodaya movement. Then the last 20 years, just before the war ended, it has also played an important role in bringing different communities together in peace building, reconciliation, inter-ethnic harmony, and also really looking into intervening in the governance structures of the country by promoting democracy and, and trying to look for a different system of governance where the power is devolved to the smallest unit, which is the village, and, and really trying to lobby towards constitutional changes, to guarantee not only individual rights, but also uh, devolution of power to the extent that the people themselves have better control of their own life. So we have evolved and today we, we uh, can say that we are active in more than 30, 40 different sectors related to development and also have developed very good relationships, very neutral, politically neutral relationships with the government as well as working with the uh, other civil society organizations and also the United Nations and particularly in a time in, in a, a crisis situation, we work in very close partnership and that is how we have evolved. So Sarvodaya while retaining uh, its character as an uh, organization deeply rooted in spiritual values, but uh, very inclusive in terms of bringing people from different socio-economic strata and also people from different faiths and different ethnic groups together and that has been the success of the movement. So with this foundation, we are now uh, posed to really look at the, some of the serious issues that the country is facing with the COVID-19 where there had been uh, disparities, now new disparities that have emerged with a lot of people also uh, losing their jobs and also we have to look at a very, very different uh, era where 
we have to live with this virus uh, COVID-19 for a long time and how do we adjust development work in the new, new what we call the new normal. How does, um, you, you describe Sarvodia as a movement more than an organization. How do the relationships with the government actually function? How, what is the, is there a formal and an informal structure? Well, uh, it, it is both formal and informal. Uh, whichever the government in power, there are ways in which we, of course, cooperate. We have to work together in certain areas related to development. And we have been doing that constant, um, uh, continuously. And there had been difficult periods because they are uh, during the time of the war and also during other times where sometimes the way we interpret the, 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 the things that are happening in the country and the approach to solve these problems there would have been differences of opinion, but we uh, work at different levels. I'll tell you, it's mostly at the grassroots level. We have to work with the grassroots uh, uh, government workers, whether they are agriculture officers or health staff or administrative staff. And they have been very cooperative because they also would like the basic needs of the people to be fulfilled. And also uh, it's very easy for the government's uh, services also to reach communities if they are better organized. So these community-based organizations, which we call the Sarvodhya Shramadana societies, have been very effective uh, as, uh, as uh, conduits between or intermediaries between uh, the uh, government services and also uh, organizing people's needs at the community level. Then also we know that the local government bodies are very, very important in terms of addressing people's needs. That's the first point of contact for local people. So there are more than, uh, there are uh, 341 local government bodies. They are at different levels. We have uh, what we call the rural Pradeshya Sabhas. Then we have town councils, uh, urban councils, and then uh, we have the municipal uh, municipalities, which are in larger uh, geography uh, populated areas. So we are, the, we are getting these, uh, village organizations through our uh, full-time uh, work uh, force and also the volunteers to connect with these local government bodies to obtain their services at the same time, uh, lately using new legal provisions like Right to Information Act to uh, make the services accountable to the people and also sometimes even giving very constructive inputs to mm -hmm. budget preparations and also having uh, scorecards, community scorecards to monitor the, the quality of services provided by local government. So that, that, that is another level of interaction between the communities, Sarvodhya movement and, and the uh, government services. Then when you come to the provincial level, there are many services related to some of the social welfare work that we do. For example, we are helping children who are in institutional care. The children who are abused physically abused, sexually abused. So we have to work with the look, the devolved structures of the government and also uh, <clears throat> receiving some of these ch children or uh, individuals who are affected by various forms of violence. We provide uh, uh, institutional care and also rehabilitation and reintegration with their families and so on. So we work uh, very closely with the government services related to social welfare and development. Then at the, 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 the national level, uh, in policy making, we are in many committees officially represented uh, in formulating uh, policies related to children, policies related to nutrition and health, policies related to uh, economic enterprise development in rural areas. So there are, there are multi, multiple mechanisms in which we engage with the government, but we do not cooperate in, uh, in things which do not agree with our philosophy or our vision of holistic uh, development. Let's turn now to the COVID crisis and Sarvodia and religious communities. Uh, there's been quite a lot of uh, notice taken of issues around burials and particularly with the Muslim community. How did that actually play out? What, what happened, but more broadly, how do you see some of the links between both the organization and the practices of different religious communities and the pandemic? Yes. 
So, Catherine, I like to start with the positive uh, sort of development that happened during the COVID-19 period. You know, uh, very interestingly, this period from from March till till May June uh, was the period that uh, most religions have some of their most important uh, days of celebration uh, or, or commemoration. Easter. You know, one year ago we had. Uh, uh, the uh, a terrorist bombing Easter Sunday. There were attacks in churches, so we were recovering from that. When uh, you know, it's one year since uh, the Easter attacks in Sri Lanka, uh, the bombings in Sri Lanka, and then uh, the uh, uh, in May the Buddhists celebrate Vesak, which is the most sacred uh, day for the Buddhists, and also then later, uh, of course, the uh, our Muslim fr friends uh, brothers. Uh, uh, celebrate Ramadan and so on. So, but the entire religious community was very, very responsible, and they they really gave very correct messages to their followers. People couldn't go to temples, people couldn't go to churches, people couldn't go to mosques uh, or Hindu kovils. But there was very uh, it, there was excellent understanding between the national leaders representing all religions. And they were supporting the measures proposed by the government without any reservations. So I think the religious leadership played a very, very important role in containing the, the transmission of disease by asking people to stay home, not attending the religious places of worship is not a violation uh, of any uh, uh, principle uh, related to religion or ritual. So uh, that awareness, I think, helped a lot. At the same time, of course, uh, the first few weeks was marked with fear, extreme fear, because there were deaths happening, uh, not just in Sri Lanka, but around the world. And the world situation was very alarming. And uh, people were confined to their homes. And everything that they got to know came through mass media. Sometimes they were sensationalizing. And there was really, so in that time of fear and, and kind of collective trauma that was happening, the religious leaders and particularly the, the Buddhist clergy, they, they were uh, you know, somehow engaging with the, the, the uh, people, their followers uh, through telephone or sometimes through uh, in a fixed time in villages, uh, uh, through uh, public address systems and pe encouraging people also to practice their uh, religion within the household. So the families were encouraged to do, uh, you know, meditation, prayers, and so on. So I think that was the positive part of it. And they were also instrumental in giving correct messages, even public health messages. And we were also part of it, trying to uh, filter some of the key messages from each religion, which would help uh, individuals to prevent getting infected uh, with uh, COVID-19. Then, of course, as you said, there was, when certain religious communities were affected, there was stigmatization and there were the social media posts which were very, very, uh, you know, unacceptable, unethical and labeling that certain communities were uh, at higher risk and they were spreading. They were even sometimes using terms like, you know, uh, uh, human, uh, you know, uh, bombs or biological bomb bombs, you know, spreading the disease. So, we, which was very, very disturbing. So, there was our share of uh, hate speech and also uh, discriminatory uh, practices reported during that period. But at the same time, there were others from the same community or other communities which stood up and said, this is wrong. So, we even be, we were also part of those efforts to give correct information and asking people, you know, you, you have to respect the rights of individuals and even the media sometimes, the, the mass media was not very helpful. They were, you know, sensationalizing and sometimes even exposing uh, the, the privacy of individuals and uh, certain ethics were violated. But when it came to very sensitive issues like the burial practices at that time, uh, it, it became a very controversial issue. So the, the medical community uh, and also the international practices were cited uh, or interpreted differently and there was difference of opinion and that also uh, led to a lot of uh, tension. But by now, 
things have uh, changed to the better and um, we, we see a situation where there's a lot of efforts to efforts made to create that understanding but we still have a long way to go and we are also very much involved in inter-religious dialogues now both with religious leaders as well as lay people and particularly young people coming together and addressing these uh, religious uh, uh, discriminatory uh, practices in in terms of uh, communication through social media and also in certain instances uh, through in in person uh, contact so that is the, the the situation right now with regard to uh, religious uh, uh, activity in relation to covid-19 one of the um observations people have made is that some countries which have experienced disasters have been better able to cope with aspects of the COVID pandemic. And of course, Sri Lanka was very much uh, at the heart of the tsunami uh, crisis uh, and the response to it. Uh, how far do you see that there were active efforts to learn lessons, but also how far do you link the success you described to the, to the history uh, of, of being a country that has, has known disaster? I think you are right, Catherine. I think we have, you know, we have faced uh, disasters, both human-induced, so-called man-made disasters, and also the natural disasters, whether it is tsunami. Tsunami was the worst disaster that affected the country. So there had been systems that evolved and also the resilience. You know, there is inherent resilience in any community, whether it's in Sri Lanka or elsewhere. We see that people, uh, they are the first responders in a, in a crisis, uh, whether it is a, a you know, flood or landslide or any other disaster. The community itself responds first before help comes from outside. So uh, after facing so many disasters, I think people have naturally developed that resilience and, and the inclination to respond quickly, not waiting for others to come and help. But in this situation, it's not different because this is the first time that we were facing an epidemic of this magnitude and the infectiousness of the virus itself made it extremely difficult uh, even for normal uh, relief and recovery work to uh, take place. Despite that, I think the people's understanding that uh, we, we have to make a sacrifice and people perceive the threat very well, I think very intelligently. And uh, so the uh, multiple ways in which the communication was passed on about the uh, about preventive measures and constant reminders through even mobile phones. Uh, you know, when you take a, a call, there will be a message before you uh, you are connected to the person that you want to uh, connect to. So those uh, those measures and of course building on the people's uh, inherent uh, resilience, uh, which have been built over the years through facing different disasters, definitely uh, help. One other thing is that. Uh, you know, our healthcare system itself is very much uh, uh, preventive uh, focus with uh, mm -hmm. uh, staff being available at that level. Access to healthcare is also uh, there, even though during the lockdown period, certain services were disrupted. But uh, having access to health workers at grassroots level also helped and self-help from uh, uh, communities. Mm -hmm. That was also a very key factor. I, I don't think very many people in Sri Lanka starved during, uh, during the COVID uh, crisis because people just shared whatever they had. They looked after the neighbors, you know, so that it's help, uh, that uh, helped a lot. That's an important story. Um, I want to go on to the issues of um, interreligious tensions, but first we do have a question uh, from Michelle Michael. How were the differences in medical burial practices and religious practices reconciled? What practical steps uh, were taken to address them? So going a bit more specifically into the burial, bur burial problem, the cremation practices, et cetera. Yes, so government policy is cremation at the moment, regardless of uh, to which uh, religion that you belong to. I personally think this has to be reviewed because uh, I, uh, as a medical specialist, I, I believe that you can uh, dispose uh, uh, 
dead bodies uh, as safely uh, even if it is uh, a burial so we should respect the the, the burial practices of uh, uh, different religions and particularly in a situation where we have very few numbers i think we could uh, uh, respect those values and allow burials and that's my personal opinion but uh, there is still no consensus at the policy level on this matter so but you said you have 12 deaths is that right yes yeah. so how did this become such an issue with because the there were yes there were few uh, deaths from the muslim community and uh, the creme uh, the burial was not allowed and the bodies were cremated so basically the issue is at least temporarily resolved because there's so few deaths is that is that uh, it's not uh, the uh, correct uh, the, the there were no deaths from the muslim community after that so uh, mm -hmm. it has not come up as an issue but i think it still it is an issue uh, which is which uh, mm -hmm. about which the muslim community is very concerned okay well let's turn now to the um, issues of conflict which of course has very complex roots as everywhere that is ethnic, historical grievances, and religious differences. Um, how, and of course you, you have celebrated, celebrate is the wrong word, you have marked the anniversary of the Easter bombings. Uh, I know you've been involved in different ways in these efforts to work towards reconciliation. Could you describe um, really what you see as the challenge and how you have been involved and really what you see as the steps for the future. Yeah, Catherine, so our position had always been that the solution to this uh, ethnic uh, problem uh, has to be from three different, uh, uh, we have to address it in three different ways. One is of course at the level of our consciousness. There's a lot of distancing that happened between different communities in Sri Lanka. We, we, we some, sometimes don't understand each other's language. We do not relate to the cultural practices. So uh, particularly when you have a war for 26 years, there is a whole generation who do not know the other. So a lot of effort has been made to get the people to understand each other, particularly young people. So those exchanges, people to people contact, all that is very important. And also we know that a lot of people have been affected, not just the people in the North and the East, but also people in the South. Many have lost their loved ones. Many have not really have had a proper closure because they are, there are many people uh, missing uh, who have uh, not been confirmed dead. So uh, without a closure, there are many, uh, who, who many families who are, who are suffering. So you need to address that psychological trauma and really uh, it's, a, uh, it's a matter of accountability as well. Then there are also economic factors. A uh, lot of people are still lacking basic needs. It's not just in the North and East, but across the country, but people in the North and East have been disproportionately affected because of the war for 20, more than 20 years. So uh, still some of the basic needs have not been addressed. Uh, you know, housing to livelihood and also access to land. So many problems are there. So, but on the positive side, we have seen the, the absence of war itself is a huge relief for all communities in Sri Lanka. So you can move about. There are, of course, reported uh, certain violations, all that is there. But on the whole, uh, things have improved and there is access to all parts of the country. And there are economic opportunities also, particularly for young people. There had been, uh, you know, even we were involved in vocational training for young people and providing startup grants for uh, pe uh, young people who had uh, good business ideas. And the government itself has also provided uh, certain uh, schemes uh, to, to help uh, 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 kickstart uh, production, particularly agriculture, fishing, and so on. So economic... Uh, uh, factors also are important to be addressed. Then, of course, the political determinants. So, we are devolution, whether it is through devolution of power or whether power sharing at a national level, these issues have not been resolved. 
we have had lot of discussions about the constitutional reform process but uh, that that didn't go very far but now we have a government which has a fresh mandate an overwhelming majority in the parliament and they have uh, uh, also now announced the new government has announced that they will go for constitutional reforms so i believe as a citizen of this, this country who believe in equality and social justice that there will be a wide wider consultation process a participatory process uh, of constitutional uh, formation uh, where all uh, communities uh, will have a say uh, to to define the future of our country so i would say that uh, having a, a positive consciousness addressing economic uh, needs and then having uh, a political uh, framework a governance framework uh, which treats every individual every community in this country uh, as equals is important and will bring about true re reconciliation but we have a very very long way to go before uh, we can say that uh, these uh, the underlying determinants that led to the war have all been addressed what about the role of what some call buddhist extremism which is what some people would see as a contradiction in terms with buddhism being associated with loving kindness and the other values that you described what what is the origin and and what do you see as the path for the future in uh in these tensions particularly between i think the buddhist and the muslim communities well you know we have uh, witnessed uh, extremism uh, in all communities in all religions uh, in one form or another during the last two three decades but as you say there are they uh, there were instances where things got more intensified i think it's also related to the power political structure that we have in in sri lanka unfortunately so we could see some of the uh, the the elements uh, who who want to mobilize these differences and using the fundamental teachings of religion in a very distorted way to draw attention uh, to to uh, you know gain power uh, but i i would say uh, if the if there is proper rule of law and and uh, real uh, uh, understanding of the 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 doctrine and overwhelming majority i think are uh, adhering to this principles of compassion and you know all the buddhist uh, non violent uh, values that we all adhere to so it's only a handful of people yes, uh, unfortunately because of the power uh, uh, struggle sometimes this uh, uh, this uh, differences are you been used by the, these groups to incite hatred incite violence which is completely uh, not in uh, line with the teachings of uh, buddhism but at the same time we have now seen lot of buddhist monks who are really following the correct path uh, taught by buddha in bringing communities together they make lot of sacrifices even during the covid 19 they were instrumental in uh, helping certain communities who were affected economically so i think we we have to address but we have to acknowledge that it's not an easy journey there will always be such extreme uh, forces but as uh, truly committed individuals towards the basic uh, mm -hmm. values uh, of buddhism we are confident that we can address and there will be hopefully with the new government having this mandate they will make sure mm -hmm. that uh, rule of law applies to everybody so that there won't be any uh, incitement of violence we need to have uh, strict laws against against hate speech and so on so we are also lobbying for such um, laws to be brought uh, in uh, introduced a new in sri lanka mm -hmm. we're seeing some questions now they were in the um, chat as opposed to the q and a so i had missed them before but let me put a couple to you let's start with um, one that's uh, pretty specific could you please comment on the quality of data collection regarding testing uh, and spread of the disease in sri lanka well uh, i would say i i i, I would uh, take these uh, reports as cor uh, correct because we have a good reporting system you know i am not so much worried about the number of tests because in 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 sri lanka 
what we have is what you call cluster transmission. There is no community transmission. And there could still be leakages. In our epidemiological language, we, we call leakages. That you have one or two cases which will go undetected. Sometimes due to various reasons of uh, having uh, the, the tests uh, being negative uh, for some reason, uh, or uh, individuals being uh, 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 not uh, properly identified as contacts of COVID-19 infected. Uh, I think the numbers in Sri Lanka are correct because invariably, uh, if the, uh, the uh, if there are more infected individuals, there is no way that uh, they will not go. They will go undetected uh, after uh, after a few few weeks. So uh, I think we have a system in place to trace each and every contact. There, there is no community transmission. Therefore, the numbers that we see are correct. Uh, the uh, testing, there is a policy because we can't uh, just uh, test uh, across the population and there is a scientific way of doing that. Those who are exposed, those who are at higher risk, in addition, there is uh, a random uh, testing also happening. So I, I would uh, rely on the statistics that are provided by the government. So I, I won't see a problem with the statistics that are being reported now. What about um, the um, question that we're seeing in a number of countries that people are afraid to go to the hospitals that you're seeing, for example, uh, maternal health issues and other diseases uh, that uh, that are not being treated and therefore general increases in, in mortality even. Yeah, so uh, there were, uh, the, this uh, situation was affected uh, in different ways uh, negatively. One is during the lockdown period, uh, you know, immunization uh, clinics could not be held and so it affected, but now it has also again started and uh, even from a medical point of view, a delay of a, a few weeks wouldn't really matter uh, so much. Uh, however, uh, people are, as you say, and not as uh, it's uh, uh, reported here uh, in the in the uh, question, uh, certain diseases people are afraid to go because they are, you know, scared uh, of uh, COVID-19, getting infected with COVID-19. But the hospitals have uh, taken precautionary measures and all the preventive health practices are uh, undertaken in with the uh, government hospitals or private hospitals. So there is no danger of hospital acquisition. I mean, there could always be, but in general, these precautions have been taken. Uh, but uh, the regular treatment for certain diseases, uh, like non-communicable diseases, there had been uh, interruption in drug supplies. And also the people who should be attending uh, clinics regularly to check their blood pressure or, um, you know, uh, progression of uh, uh, heart disease or whatever, I, they, they, they have been affected. So we are yet to see. But I would say that uh, particularly nutrition, child nutrition is something that I'm uh, really worried about because during the lockdown period, uh, uh, even though there was a food supply um, to many areas, the quality of food, and particularly amongst children, we know that some of the low-income families didn't have proper access to a balanced diet. So that will also manifest. And so we are yet to see, but so far we haven't seen uh, any uh, bigger, any outbreak of any other disease, uh, which is out of control. So I would say still our healthcare system is not at all overwhelmed. Now we are uh, we have uh, uh, prepared uh, the hospitals uh, the, the, for, to receive COVID-19 patients and still it, the, the number of active cases are very low. So uh, the uh, healthcare system is not overwhelmed. So there is uh, a reluctance on the part of the people sometimes to go for healthcare, but I don't think that's a serious issue. What about the um, issues that you referred to uh, at the beginning of the concerns about child abuse, uh, the neglect of children and domestic violence, the issues for women. How are you 
seeing that and what is the response? How serious is that? How worried are you, I guess is the question. Yes, I think if I, I be very honest, I'm very worried about it and very sad about it. Uh, even before COVID-19, Sri Lanka unfortunately had a very bad record when it came to child protection. Even though our indicators, uh, other indicators of child survival, you know, infant mortality rate, the child mortality rate, all those indicators are very impressive compared to other countries. However, when it comes to child protection, we haven't, we don't have a good record. So child abuse had been a, a major issue, partly related to a large number of women going to Middle East for employment, leaving their children behind and the, the necessary protection is not there. And also the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the economic uh, system is so demanding that the caregivers uh, don't have enough time to uh, really uh, provide care for their uh, children. And they are not safe in sometimes even in schools and uh, there is corporal punishment. So there are different forms of uh, violence against children in Sri Lanka. And when the COVID-19 happened, the children were confined to homes and then sometimes even the parents are unable to cope with the uh, situations because you know uh, the, the, the children's own behavior have been affected by being confined to homes and they don't have the skills and guidance to uh, you know uh, take care of the children's behavior in, in certain uh, difficult situations so there had been helplines and you know all that but despite all that uh, it's sad that we have seen a, a significant rise of reports of <clears throat> violence against children, child abuse in Sri Lanka. Same with domestic violence, violence against women. So uh, we have to address this issue and there are many groups working on this. There had been new hotlines uh, 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 created uh, during that period and trained workers are intervening. Then also there are uh, systems in place through the, through the police. Uh, so uh, we are trying to address that, but I think we need to address the uh, root causes. This is one of the uh, biggest negative outcomes of the COVID-19 uh, uh, lockdown and the subsequent uh, uh, problems that we are facing. Are there any distinctive issues that stand out for Sri Lanka on these issues of, of abuse and protection? Um, any government policy issues, any history tied to religion? How do, you, how do you answer the question of why this is so serious? Well, it, it is a multitude of factors. As I said, one is that the, the, the caring for children is not there because the main caregiver mother, in most cases, now Sarode looks after more than 600 children who are either abandoned or who are made often uh, or who are you know, uh, abused. When you look at the histories, it's very complicated. Uh, it is either the mother is abroad or uh, the, the, the father has abandoned the, the mother. Uh, so uh, economic problems and the children are also sometimes uh, uh, living in institutions and uh, uh, sometimes even, institu in, even in institutions, they are not uh, uh, protected. So it, it's a multitude of problems and I think we know the reasons and we need to address. So when it comes to policy, uh, I think it's policies are there, it's just that uh, the, the policies are often not implemented. For example, there was a, uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, law to ban mothers who have had children below uh, a certain age from leaving. Uh, for employment abroad. Now, uh, the compliance uh, is doubtful because otherwise we won't see some of the cases that we are seeing, some of the child abuse cases that we are seeing. So uh, strict enforcement of the law is also not there. And also the, the justice system, you know, average time for a, for a case uh, related to uh, uh, child abuse takes more than 10 years. And um, uh, so, and the rate of conviction is very, very low. And even the judicial system has its own shortcomings where the victim, the child uh, himself or herself has to attend court proceedings, sometimes in very far away uh, places from where they are looked after. So these are, these are policy issues, as you say, that need to be uh, corrected. But in general, 
it is the child protection mechanism more than the more than the uh, law the the policy uh, that is at fault Mustafa Ali is asking um, how you see religion or religious leaders um, addressing these issues. How, how conscious are they of the problems and are there specific leaders? Uh, how are women involved uh, in this, in both preventing and responding? A very good question. So we have now uh, uh, several interreligious committees that have been formed. One uh, under the Global Network of Religions for Children, Patronage, uh, you know, the uh, Arigato Foundation International's uh, uh, support. Uh, we have formed uh, an interreligious group, which is an, at a national level with very, very eminent uh, uh, religious leaders representing Buddhist, Christian, Islam, and Hindu traditions. And uh, they are constantly working and giving guidelines and uh, creating uh, advocacy programs, education programs, which, which are quite effective. Then we have also done uh, a survey through the religious leaders, how uh, they can respond better. And sometimes there are also reports of violations have, happening within religious institutions as well. So we need to address that. And there has to be an honest discussion on that as well. So I think we are one of the... Uh, positive outcomes of the COVID-19 situation is that the religious leaders actually stepped up their, their efforts and even now uh, going into uh, doing some messaging based on the, the religion's teachings themselves and forming some support mechanisms, preventive mechanisms, and also if there are uh, and mechanisms to detect early uh, those children who are in vulnerable situations who, who may be uh, subject to abuse, uh, how we can uh, identify them and take uh, precautions. So I'm very uh, happy about the, the energy, but we need uh, it to be scaled up. Uh, it's right now happening only in, uh, in, in the at a national level, but we need to uh, take it to the grassroots level, which we'll be doing the, during the next uh, few months until the end of the year. UNICEF is supporting us on that. So I think uh, we will use the religious leaders uh, to we will get them to lead this, uh, this effort. What about child marriage? Um, I know that during the conflict that was an issue. Is that still something that there's debate about within religious communities or the, what are the, yeah. what's happening to the levels? So at the moment, it is only uh, happening with the Muslim community. The, the law applies uh, uh, to, to other, uh, other communities. Of course, there are, uh, there are teenage marriages uh, that are happening, but that's, uh, that's, that's a concern. So, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not um, uh, uh, legal, uh, but at least uh, it's, uh, it, it's being uh, addressed, but uh, there is a big debate on uh, the, the age of marriage for uh, Muslim uh, women. Uh, so that is, uh, that has to be um, addressed uh, through, through discussion with the uh, mm -hmm. concerned uh, community uh, leaders and the government. One question about, uh, has come up about education um, and what's the status of schools and how was the experience with online education? Is that, are there lessons for the education system coming out of the crisis? Well, uh, uh, just like the healthcare system, uh, Sri Lanka's education, public health, edu public education system is also universally free for all children in Sri Lanka, even that's up to the university level. So uh, the, uh, the online access had been a problem. So m more than 50%, I would say, didn't have access to online in, uh, classes or education because simply they didn't have uh, the, the, la the laptops or computers or even tabs or mobile phones to uh, access. So, uh, but still for, for many, I think uh, that was a big relief and the parents were somehow getting the children to connect to the teacher and the school through the uh, the uh, connect uh, remotely and uh, however now uh, the, the physical classes will start this week therefore hopefully 
uh, in a very safe way. There are strict health guidelines given and uh, the school uh, authorities are uh, bound to adhere to those uh, uh, health guidelines and uh, start the schools. And also the children have been quite well educated, informed about the preventive measures. But we know that they are children and uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, keeping distance in, in crowded classrooms and all that is a big challenge. But uh, as we are uh, in a cluster transmission situation without uh, community transmission, I think uh, the normal schooling can happen. But if there is any outbreak again, uh, then of course we'll, we'll have to see uh, increasing uh, online access. And Sarvodhi is also working on that trying to set up some kind of community group learning mechanisms so that uh, connectivity doesn't have to be uh, by individuals or by individual families, but they can you know, safely come to uh, one place, maintaining distance and then have a, uh, have a lesson uh, by, by the school, conducted by the school or the teacher. So there's a lot that we can do and offline education as well. Uh, to that extent, a lot of people are experimenting uh, but the government uh, has also uh, made uh, uh, provision to bring down the, the connectivity cost uh, by uh, through the uh, internet providers uh, so that it becomes uh, affordable. So there are mechanisms in which uh, that, uh, this uh, digital divide, uh, the access uh, issue is also being addressed. Uh, we're coming to the end, but and I know we want to end on a positive note, but can I squeeze in one more question uh, as to how much thinking there is in the education system about dealing with some of the social, ethnic, and religious tensions? Uh, are there new ideas coming up that might might change things or might lead to a new uh, a new approach? Uh, so far, we haven't seen very revolutionary changes that are happening, but we have seen in the curricula a uh, lot of, uh, you know, like stories from different religions being, be, being uh, taught to uh, children. And also uh, certain projects uh, encourage children from different communities to work together. So such things are happening. So I would say the next generation will not be having uh, ethnic or religious uh, bigotry and also another very positive uh, thing is about language learning. Uh, now all children have to learn Tamil, Sinhalese children have to learn Tamil and Tamil children need to uh, learn Sinhala. So there will be you know that that understanding at least to to appreciate the, the different culture and communicate with each other. And also we have seen a lot of civil society groups organizing interactions between uh, school children. So uh, we could see even if there's some space within the formal curriculum that that is being sort of used to um, uh, connect uh, with other children and address. Uh, but I think we need to uh, have uh, more changes in the education system where we have more mixed schools and uh, you know with different ethnic groups uh, different religion religious groups studying together i think there we need a lot of policy changes uh, to happen that requires of course a government commitment uh, which we we would like to see well we are uh, just a minute off the end so i want to see do you have a a minute of positive thoughts or messages or requests or ideas well, uh, as I said, uh, we are very lucky that we have contained uh, the disease uh, very effectively, uh, but we have to open up the country because we, we, we are a country which has attracted a uh, lot of tourists and there's a lot of cultural exchanges and it's a dynamic uh, nation in the Indian ocean. So we would like uh, uh, the country to flourish again and address all these issues. So the recovery while we are uh, recovering internally from the socio-economic impact of COVID, there is a lot of enthusiasm, particularly amongst the younger generation. That is the, the, that's the, that's where I see the hope 
they really were very active even during the COVID-19 period. We could see them come on, coming up with all kinds of innovations and, and new ways of addressing people's problems. Now they are sometimes raising funds to help uh, small businesses which have collapsed and also they themselves start creating uh, enterprises that can be you know, helping uh, those uh, who, uh, th those having good uh, business ideas and also the local production from agriculture to home gardening. A uh, lot of creative things are happening. People looking at their own uh, potential rather than waiting from outside. So we have seen a lot of new businesses uh, happening online and particularly in the agriculture sector. We have seen value addition and all that. So we see uh, it's a very exciting phase. Uh, where people's talents are being harnessed with, out of a sheer need. Uh, so it's the holistic approach of uh, what we believe in Sarvo, the holistic approach to development that is happening where you know, sp the best of spiritual values coming out because people have learned uh, that we can live with much, much less uh, than we, we consume uh, normally. And uh, this threat can come back. So that has reminded us of the impermanence of life and work towards a uh, much nobler uh, goal in life. Well, that's a very inspirational way to end what for me has been a fascinating and very informative conversation. So very grateful to you uh, and wish you well and look forward to continuing the discussion. So thank, thank you, you all Catherine. very much for participating. Thank you, Vinya. That's been wonderful.